My name is Chris Little. I am the host of the Lifestyle Chase Podcast. This is Season 5. All right, so I am back to the virtual episodes of the Lifestyle Chase Podcast. If we have never met before, I am your host, Chris Little. I'm joined for the first time by Jay Weedall. Did I get your last name right? Absolutely. Two words pressed together. Weed all, <laughs> or weed and all of it. That's right. Yeah. Honestly. Kids when I was little, uh, the name was weed all down his leg or weed all about it. So easy to remember if you think of those two terrible jokes. I was just going to comment. That's like the best sort of like drill that anybody has ever shared about remembering their name. So it's not going to be <laughs> tough for anybody to, uh, figure out how to remember you or find you on social media. It'll be nice and easy. But with that said, let's say say nobody has ever heard of you before. How do you introduce yourself in a room full of strangers? Ooh, I probably don't (laughs) to begin with. I'm probably more of a uh, sit and watch and sit and listen, I think. I'm not a massive fan of big crowds or hanging out in rooms full of strangers. But if I had to, I guess usually the easy thing for people to notice, especially in the US, is is that I have an accent. So most people usually ask me where I'm from. And then my my toy, basically, that I always give people is I just give people an opportunity to guess because no one ever gets it right. The weirdest one I've ever got, I think, is Luxembourg. He says, where are you from? I love your accent. I'll say, well, I'll give you a guess. And they're like, hmm, let me think. Luxembourg. I'm like, well, that was pretty harebrained. And no, it's not. So I am, uh, yeah, I'm from Manchester, Northern England. And, uh, but that's it. That's probably how I would do it. I'm not the kind of person, I guess, that would dive in unless somebody was talking about English Premier League football, at which point I'd probably have some things to say. But other than that, I'm, I'm probably going to stand on the skirts a little bit. And then that's the that's the skill I'll use. I think is the I have the 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 fortunate ability to be able to have an accent, which is quite good. <laughs> well, I mean, like I like that you bring up accent because I know that a lot of my listeners are going to be like that guy has a Canadian accent because when I look at the analytics, it's sixty percent American listeners. Um, when I first started, I would say it was like 80 to 90% like Edmontonian listeners. So it's just kind of cool to see the evolution and like Edmonton Mm -hmm. being like the city that I'm in. So it's just, it was very niche audience. And, uh, as I kind of diversify the, uh, the guest list and stuff, I'm sure that'll grow some of that audience once more, but I wanted to give some context out as how I got connected to you in the first place. And you might not recall. Mm -hmm. But I was having a chat with uh, Coach Matt Ferrara, like probably in 2020 or so. There was a period of time where um, other coaches, I would just set up like video calls with them. People that I met through the Compound Performance Mentorship, people who I've met through like mutual friends and stuff like that. And we just spend like an hour or two just like talking. And at one Mm -hmm. point, him and I were talking about just like good people and he put you on my radar. Um, And then I connected with you and you actually responded and said, thanks for following me. I'm like, oh, dude, I just clicked a button. I'm not not the hero (laughs) of the story. Um, But then after that, you and I were both in a workshop that Jenny Rierick put on. So I got to kind of like put a face to a name. And so that was really cool Mm -hmm. because there's lots of familiar faces in that little group. And so it's just, I like how much opportunity there is, even as an introvert, because you, the way you described yourself sounded pretty introverted to me. I, myself, I'm also very introverted. And I have found that sort of there's a huge opportunity if we're open to it, to get to know people that can completely change our career, that can completely uh, mm-hmm. change us, our perspective on things, our life, our lifestyle, etc. With that said, as far as like how you occupy the fitness space, let's dig into that a bit more. You've recently kind of almost started like rebranding yourself. It looks like you got a lot of momentum, some exciting things happening. Like what what is on the go right now at this present moment? Well, I'll I'll come back to that. If that's okay, I'll jump back quickly. I had no idea that you'd spoken to Matt. 
I actually hired Matt Ferreira before uh, at a gym that I ran when we had a studio space in maybe 2018, I'm guessing. And not long after we hired him, he got an opportunity to move to, to New Hampshire. And we just kind of stayed in touch a little bit through text messages or Instagram or whatever it was. So it's always interesting to me that even though I didn't have a close relationship with Matt probably in between 2018 and, and 2020 when it sounds like you connected with him, that our persona, the things that we're doing, being trying to be a good person, I guess, for, for want of a better term, is always following us. We are always on show and there's a pros and cons to that. To that, I guess, that the aspect of, of what we do in health and fitness, I don't think any other industry is quite like health and fitness it, it sh people are shining a light on health and fitness all the time because there's a novelty and there's a an availability of it but to people like me and you and, and to matt and, and so many others it is our career as well and i think that's a fine line to 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 balance sometimes and the fact that my name came up in a conversation it's anchored around who's a good person to talk to that's quite nice. That's probably the best compliment you you could give me. So I'm I'm glad. I'll have to send him a to send him a bribe in the mail or something. Or something. Um, <laughs> well, he just got married. He just got, yeah, married, he's got married as well. He's got married this past weekend. So there you go. He's he's getting blown up. His Instagram's going to get smashed with congratulations after people listen to this. Um, uh, so sorry, a quick segue there, and then just going back to your question. I recently sold a gym that I founded to my business partner. And so I founded a gym in 2016 in the heart of Boston after working in a Boston sports clubs for long enough to know better. How about that? I was the fitness manager. I was good at it, but it burned me out. I became a personal trainer. I was good at it and I realized that it could be done better. So on a whim with lots of confidence, but no plan other than the, the best plan you think you can have at that time because you don't have any experience in owning a business. I asked for investors from clients. They gladly gave us money and into business we went in 2016 and and it, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. All the way up until about March 2020 <laughs> when obviously other things changed and and we had actually just moved from our studio space, which was about 1,500 square feet, maybe 1,000 usable for gym, gym floor, where we focused mostly on training with kettlebells in small groups and personal training because kettlebells really were just the, the space-saving tool that we, we needed to, to be able to do all the things that we needed to do and get good results and, and build a good reputation. And then we moved into this massive space, 3,600 square feet, maybe 2,600 usable incredible space we are open for I, I would imagine seven weeks and then we closed as everybody did because of the pandemic and that changed some things uh and all the way through the pandemic I, I don't feel and i've said this to my wife before i never had any fear that i wasn't going to be able to figure it out i was never worried about going out of business because I couldn't control it. If we couldn't open for another six months or something like that, then what could I do about it? I just have to figure it out. I just, I think the word that got overused during the pandemic was maybe pivot. Businesses are pivoting. That word just kind of got trodden, trodden to death. But it is what we did. We constantly did a great job in making small, small adjustments to continue to accommodate the, the scenario and the situations. And I think one of the reasons that we were really successful during that time is because prior to the unknown of, of the pandemic, we were really consistent with the information that we put out to people about our intention to make health and fitness part of their lives, to build confidence and independence in their own health and fitness. So when the world shut down and we just gave away all our kettlebells and if it wasn't nailed down you could have it and even then we <laughs> unscrewed some things to give it to some people it was just a no-brainer people just continued to do it so we were very fortunate in that respect but i also think we did a great job building up to that and we were lucky enough to have some some years under under our belt fast forward a couple of years a couple of years how long is the pandemic yeah, been going on now? Does, does it have a cap? We don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. Time is this nebulous thing now. Anyway, fast forward some time in, in years. And 
my business partner and I basically just, I think we just ran our course in our relationship. And, and I think we both decided that we were different people and we both, it would be better for us individually and for the business if we went our, our separate ways. And I was, it was a difficult decision to make and it was bloody hard and, and it was not easy for a couple of years. And then the last six months of, of planning to, to move on was, was really difficult, but it was a decision I wanted to make to, to move on. And so I, she bought me out and, and best of luck and, and on we go. And so what I've got going on right now is I've got a few things going on right now, actually. <laughs> I've got four things going on right now. I'm working partly with a company based out of the UK through a friend of a friend of a friend who I went to college with, college, not university, who is a dietitian. And I'm working with them as a subject matter expert for some ongoing projects that they've got in, they're mostly based in food and nutrition, dietetics. And so they brought me in as a, a subject matter expert for accompanying training stuff. So that's number one. Number two, I just randomly got an email from a guy at the Boston branch of the Coast Guard, forgot what it was then, I'm pretty sure the UK doesn't have a Coast Guard, so this is completely new to me, about going and working with some of their uh, troops, are they troops that if you work with the Coast Guard, I don't know, but going and working with some of their people uh, in some training capacities, so that that's upcoming. And then I've got two things that I'm working on more full-time. The main is my bread and butter of training. I'm working entirely online right now, entirely remotely, not virtually. I'm not coaching people over screens because good luck to anybody who's doing that. But I could think of nothing I'd like to do less than to train somebody in their living room over Zoom. That sounds horrific. I did it for a long time when we had to, but it, it wasn't. It's definitely not what I wanted to continue to do. So that, that's multifaceted. There's nutrition coaching, there's one-on-one -on -one coaching, and then I'm building up into a transformation program, which I'm really excited about, and, and maybe I'll talk more about it. And then the second thing I've got running kind of concurrently with that is work with Jenny, who, who we both know, Jenny Rerick with fit to speak We've got some things in the pipeline at trying to continue to build that because if I zoom all the way back, to 2016 when I thought personal training in big box gyms is shit, I could do a better job. I could do a better job from a training standpoint. I think what now upon reflection, what I realize everybody could do a better job with is communicating to the person in front of them, speaking in a language that they understand, that they value, that we recognize their preferences, their experiences, that we're empathetic where necessary, that we're a little bit more hard-lined where necessary, rather than having this, this is the way I do things and it's my way or the highway. You can still do that, but the most successful coaches are going to be the ones who can swing a little left to right across that spectrum of good communication. And so working with Jenny there, there's some things in the pipeline about working with coaches in the future, small group, personal trainers, team coaches, that kind of stuff. Does that answer oh, your question? <laughs> like that is awesome. I mean, I wanted to kind of unpack sort of like where you're at now. And I'm glad that you added some context to the past. The, the cool mm -hmm. thing is just uh, sort of knowing what I know about taking a leap and knowing like how exciting your future will be just i'm kind of one of those people that i am more optimistic than pessimistic especially when a person has like the drive and the work ethic and just like they're clear on like what their purpose is so mm -hmm. i've enjoyed seeing sort of like that glow up that has taken play in your media and stuff i'm like oh man like dude looks like a badass. He's like, he's doing some independent stuff now, like especially independent. This is cool. And I actually, I get a lot of joy out of those aspects in the fitness industry, whether it be situations like people getting married or people taking a leap for themselves or people getting a dog because I'm like, if we're just getting angry at people for winning. Like, how are we going to win ourselves? Yeah. I think it's such an important sentiment for people to remember is that you should want everybody in your circle to be winning like 
if your goal is financial, you should want everybody in your circle to get it, get their financial goals. And if they're slipping, figure out a way to get them there because you're the product of the people that you're surrounded with. So yeah, like it, it's exciting to see what is to come. Um, and I can imagine that shift and transition probably had a lot of introspection and I can imagine there's probably a lot of like tough, tough moments in this last saga of time from 2020 to blur. <laughs> so, saga is a great yeah. word for it. Saga is the perfect, perfect description of, of the last fuck knows how Well, long. I mean, like, let's unpack that yeah. a bit. Like what, what has that journey been like for you? I have spoken quite a bit about my journey, but I'm kind of curious what it would have been like for you with uh, like, you've got more experience than me. There's more life experience. There's all kinds of different experience that I can gain from your um, time. Oh. Uh oh. Okay, I'm you're back. back. You're back. I hear you again now. You just froze for a second. That's okay, fine. So, where I left off was uh, experience that I can gain from your time. Yeah. I, well, first things first, I have no problem. I, at first, I, I, when I first started going to therapy, I was a bit worried about telling people I was going to therapy for m multiple reasons, but I don't give a shit at all anymore. Therapy has been super, super helpful, mainly because of the kind of person I am and then the kind of work that I do. The kind of person that I am is I grew up in a middle class family in the north of England. I'm the middle of three, three brothers. I would, I'm from what on from the outside looks like a really cool, perfect nuclear family. And then all of a sudden not being from that and having to do a lot of be really independent really quickly, probably more independent and more grown up than I needed to be on my ears. And until starting to go to therapy, which is actually right at the start of the pandemic as well, perfectly timed. I hadn't intended on it, but it was maybe six weeks before speaking to a therapist who's amazing i i hadn't realized how much of every single day was just more it was more pennies in a particular personality bucket it was more contribution to a way of thinking to a persona to a belief system and i from the age of probably about 11 when i, I needed to do a lot more of the quick growing up up until being old man, 36, up until being 33, I had been doing things in a way that had been contributing to those personas and beliefs. And I, I hadn't been particularly self-reflective, even though I would maybe in my 20s, I probably would have described myself as being self-reflective, but you don't know what you don't know. And what therapy allowed me to do was like, just organize that stuff, organize it in a way that made me stop. It gave me space to think about actually, oh yeah, this situation is quite similar to this situation. And this does kind of make sense how I got here. And knowing how you get somewhere is super useful. It allows you to be able to reverse engineer things and understand them a little bit better. If if you were to, if you had a goal of losing 50 pounds and you lost 50 pounds and you got to the end of this two year period and you lost 50 pounds, but you have no fucking idea how you did it, it's probably not as valuable an experience for you as actually getting to the outcome. It would be super useful if you could reverse engineer what worked, what didn't, why you were successful in certain areas, why you weren't successful in other areas. And so therapy very much allowed me to do that. And I think that played a critical part in me just understanding more of what I wanted from work, from life, from relationships. It, that, that was brilliant. Because I think sometimes maybe people think of therapy as that you're changing who you are, but I still am incredibly self-sufficient, just as I was when I was 10. I still push myself physically, just as I did when I was a youth athlete and played sports to a high level. They're still parts of me. I still, I probably have better but I still am focused on emotional regulation. I don't lose my temper just like I didn't when I was little. And if I did lose my temper when I was little, it wasn't many, it wasn't very much because I knew it didn't really get me anywhere. It's still allowed. I, I, I'm still the kind of person that 
is very organized and likes to put things in priorities and, and likes lists and stuff. I, I've always been that way. So it's, it wasn't like completely changing myself. It was just an opportunity to organize my my thoughts and my stuff a little bit better or not significantly better, not a little bit better. I don't want to underplay this significantly better. And I think maybe the key facet is in all of that, that I had anchored myself to a person who suited all my needs, all my unmet needs from when I was little. I still wanted to be loved and I still wanted to be supported and I still wanted to be told that I was good at this thing. And I found a person, I found a partner, in my business partner, I found a partner who I wanted to kind of, I wanted her to give me that stuff. She was the, she's the, basically the opposite. They're not Neither of our faults. She's just basically the opposite. And so she was the perfect person for me to go and try and force to see that I was worthy and force to see that I was, uh, you know, yeah, worth, worth the accolades and like, Oh, you don't think I can do it? Hold my beer, watch this shit. You know, I'm, I'm going to go and take care of business. And then on the other side of that is I have a partner who is my wife, Jen, who is the most supportive person that you could ever possibly imagine. She's basically that already. She still challenges me to do stuff, but she's, she is all those things that I could never imagine. And then some, she's actually quite hard to fathom. Honestly, you know, when you just meet that person and you're like, uh, I don't know what this is right now and I'm going to try and understand it, but Jen is that person. So I think that's the backstory of maybe the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years of 10 years of getting into this career. And over time, it, that's been super useful to try and prove myself or have somebody who I thought was going to tell me everything I was amazing or that I was really good at this thing, but it never came because that forced me to work really hard. And it came at some cost because nothing is ever good enough if, if you never get told it's good enough. But at the same time, it also allowed me to, I'm very aware that it allowed me to cr- accrue great experience. I, It forced me to challenge myself maybe beyond what I would have done had I not have had that relationship with, with somebody, mm-hmm. if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, no, everything about that is like super yeah. clear. And I'm going to add like a little bit of sort of additional points to almost amplify just the value of therapy. Um, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. over the history of this show, I think I've spoken about my experience in seeing a counselor and stuff, like probably for 10 different episodes and it all like where I kind of cracked open was during the pandemic. Um, but the context that we kind of dove into, it pertained to like my experiences in the fitness industry and my experiences with my sense of self-worth and the value that I gained from having someone to essentially basically deconstruct all of this stuff in my head was that I was able to see it like almost reorganized somewhere else. And mm-hmm. then I was able to be a bit more proactive in my, in my future moves. And like from a uh, return on investment standpoint, like my career for better or worse turned right around, like after sessions with my counselor. And it's the, the kind of thing that mm-hmm. I'm proactive about uh, seeking out on a continuous basis, kind of like doing an oil change. It's the kind of thing that the most like masculine dudes that I know how already benefit from or could stand to benefit from um, like there's, there's no, like you don't have to fit in a box to work on your mental health with a professional. It's actually kind of one of those things that gives you like an edge. Um, the things that made it easier <laughs> for me to approach it were actually um, when I would first start talking about mental health on this podcast and I've talked about it a lot. Uh, it's something that's very close to home for me. I've had some very personal experiences with it, but when I first started talking about it, I would actually talk to like other trainers about it and they would open up to Mm -hmm. me. Like, uh, my friend, Jason Leanarts, he told me about how he would have to go through like three or four different uh, therapists or counselors to find the right one for him. Um, I've had countless other friends talk about how, how they've seen a therapist, uh, Jason or Jordan Syatt, 
came on the show and he talked about mm -hmm. seeing a therapist. And so it's just when other people make it more normal and sometimes we don't realize mm -hmm. like the, uh, how our impression lies with somebody else. Like we might think we're just a trainer, but somebody else might be kind of like watching for us to do something for them to feel like it's okay for them to do it too. So I thought it'd be mm -hmm. helpful to add that to it because what I found to help me was I started to give myself credit for more of the things that I've done because I otherwise would have never, I would mm -hmm. have just worked myself into the ground, given up, quit. Um, many times in the pandemic, my career was close to being done, which is crazy because um, it's <laughs> things are very busy and there's a lot on the go. Like I have a, a list of different projects and stuff, but even despite that, what people are seeing on the outside didn't quite match what was going on in the inside. I was just ready to be like, okay, whatever, just mm -hmm. work at a grocery store or something, just find something that pays for the mortgage. Um, yeah. It's very easy to be struggling. And when a person is struggling, the most beneficial thing for them is like connection. And so us as professionals, when we're able to connect with like a professional, but also with our colleagues, when we're able to have like this candid conversation with one another and we feel comfortable that if like, if we have a really dark day next week, we could just message each other. I think that's a really important part of this industry. Um, it's something that I'll probably promote more and more because I'm realizing that it doesn't hurt to say, Hey, be there for your homie. Like be there for people and help people win and stuff like that. But sort of the point that I'm trying to make here is that if somebody was thinking like, I want to do this career for the longest period of time possible, A, it's important to understand that you need to work on yourself because working on yourself will develop a better external product and give you a better human experience. You're going to be able to receive people's positive feedback and actually like hear it and it'll stick. And <laughs> you're going to be able to change more people's lives because you're not going to be projecting so much of your own struggles on other human beings. Like it's, that's the tough truth that we need to face in the mirror. But when we know it, our business benefits and uh, yeah, because like, I have a follow-up question though. Go for it. I'm ready. Do you, do you, I'm trying to make this open-ended and I've been trying to do it as I've been listening to you say, listen to you speak. Oh, but I can't do it. Do you think that because most, lots of personal trainers are independent personal trainers or they always desire to own their own gym that, or, or to be their own boss, that that plays a part in this? Because if, if you're always in control of everything and you're always responsible for everything, then you all your bandwidth is taken up is how I think of it. And if all your bandwidth is taken up, then how do you discern what's useful, what's not useful? If just everything flows upstream to you, how do you discern so what is useful and what's not useful without support like that? I think my my angle that I've had in my experiences in the industry, because like not a lot of people know, but more of my career has been as a contractor than has been as an employee. Like I've contracted for other businesses in large segments of my career. But like the first gym that I was mm -hmm. at, they hired me on as an employee and then they shut down after eight months. And then I was a contractor on my own. And awesome. so a big like gap for me was I had this longing feeling. I just wanted to have friends. Like I felt like it was just me against the world. I tried to, I did a collaboration with a couple of the other trainers that were having to find a gym and we created a brand together and that was going to be my lifeline. Um, that was going to be the thing where I would know I would always, it wasn't just me against the world. It was me and my friends and we were mm -hmm. going to collaborate and tackle these big things. And then they ended up parting ways. They wanted to do their own projects and that was all good and fine because I was realizing I had to sort of like make sort of like a, a plan in place. I needed to make friends like my life depended on it. And so as I would connect with absolute strangers for the podcast in doing that, I was making friends for the longevity of my career because I knew that there would come a day when I would just have a really tough time 
and I would just need someone to lean on or give me career advice. And whenever I've uh, pursued personal development, the, the things that have helped me the most were the friendships that came out of it. The things that light me up about mm -hmm. mentorships is when I see someone just do something amazing and then I'm watching all my peers and friends cheering that person on like there's no tomorrow. When I see someone mm -hmm. hit like a 400 pound trap bar deadlift and they've never done that before and you got like power lifters from Australia, you got like gen pop trainers from like, I don't know, England, like everybody's coming in and they are just like fired up or somebody gets a dog. Like it's that kind of stuff that, uh, that lights me up. And then that's what gives me sort of like an accessory piece in addition to like a professional where I'm able to have people to kind of bounce ideas off. I'm able to kind of have people to keep me really humble because not only am I having people as a soundboard, but I'm having people who are leading by example. And so I'm able to pull from the examples that they're putting out into the space. I'm like, okay, I didn't think about it that way. I can learn, I can do better. And I can, I can learn from what they've demonstrated here. Like always being open to the opportunities for learning because I think it's just such a game changer. Like we can all safely admit that all of us have an ego and that ego is probably going to get in our way at some point. And it's at the point where we're willing to put a little bit of faith in somebody else's feedback that we will start to ascend and grow and reach our goals. But if we're not willing to um, take somebody's feedback and actually like apply it into action, we're only going to hold ourselves back. And so something like therapy is one of those tools that can make it a lot easier to access our self-awareness of that, knowing that we have an ego, mm -hmm. we got to deal with it. We got to put it aside. Sometimes, sometimes ego is good because it gives us confidence and we need confidence in this industry because we are kind of selling ourselves and then we're helping other people to find the confidence within themselves. So if we're not confident, we're only going to be able to get them so confident, if that makes sense, but kind of a long ramble. Yeah, I mean, the one of the key things I heard you say there was having people to to pull from and, and being able to build relationships and, and feel supported. And I think something like this, having a podcast that does talk about less about the nuts and bolts and about the nitty gritty of niche aspects of, of the role of being a coach, personal trainer, powerlifter, whatever it is, and talking more to people as people and their backstories and that kind of stuff that that's an opportunity for other people to feel like they're part of this relationship and maybe they can learn stuff from different perspectives on the same stuff that maybe they're going through and and although i, I don't I, I don't know if this is a good thing or not but this this could potentially is like a form of group therapy is learning from people around you and and it's also quite disarming as well to just to pale people <laughs> sitting in on a podcast, on a podcast uh, talking to each other and uh, potentially if there's even a nugget of, of something helpful in there and feeling Look, this is useful then then great then then that helps build that and even just think about right back to what you said at the start the fact that you know matt and i know matt and we know him through different things and we've talked to different people about different people and stuff like that is relationship building and you're right i think being in the fitness industry can very easily become it's me against the world. I'm, I'm on an island. People buy me. Uh, there's so many people out there. There's, so, there's such a transient place where people are coming and going and, and people don't value expertise. They only value novelty and they only value the thing that looks the slickest. Yeah, we, we are always fighting against that collective. That's like a collective ego, I guess, or that collective perception of what fitness is. And so it can be very useful to gain support and alternate point of views from people who are similar enough to you but not so similar that they just bounce back the same shit over and over and over again because that's probably not helpful they've got to be similar enough that you can talk to them but different enough that you can learn something it's from. true it's so true and i mean um to your point about like bouncing it back i strongly encourage if people are in the space and they're hearing some good ideas and stuff or 
they have good ideas of their own, or maybe somebody's not talking about something on the show that they wanted to have talked about, like there was a conversation that didn't take place. I would encourage them to start that because like not a lot of people realize that like, I mean, when I first wanted to have conversations on podcasts, like, I mean, I would ask a few people like, what, what does it take to be on podcast? And then I got told no once and I was, Oh, well, I guess I should start my own podcast. And then I asked them like, how do you start a podcast? And they're like, well, are you just starting a podcast to be famous? Are you starting a podcast to start a podcast? I'm like, I'm starting a podcast to start a podcast. I like to talk. Um, and so that, that was like the beginning. And so a lot of people will see me like 250 or 300 episodes in, like I started it in October, 2018. And they'll see like the momentum when I've gotten more practiced and when I've talked to a wide array of different people about a wide array of different topics. And they won't realize that I had a day one just like they can. And if they start now, then they can rack up some reps. But if they never start, they'll never get there. And it's tough love, but it's just, you either start or you don't. So do you want it or not? Like, do you want to be on podcast or you not? Or do you not want to be? Because like sometimes you, it's like what you put in is what you get out sort of thing. Um, you know, one of the best ways you can work out what you do want to do is to try loads of things and work out what you don't want to do. You know, if there's a thousand doors that you can go through, the goal is to try and close 997 of them so you can have three good options. But you have to go through a good few fucking doors to be able to, to figure that out. So if that's the if that's what's holding people back, then just start swinging. Just start swinging and, and, and pick up some reps, as you say. Well, and the other thing that oftentimes I think can get in people's ways is uh, people get more competitive than what's necessary in order to reach their goal. So if we look at like the statistics of general population of most of the communities that this podcast is going to reach, whether it be the U S or Canada or anywhere beyond, a lot of people can benefit from the help of a fitness professional. And in a lot of cases, they're waiting for the fitness professional that speaks to them or they're waiting for like the service model that attracts them best or the one that they'll have the greatest buy-in towards. There's always going to be more than enough opportunity for more than enough professionals to have a abundant, fulfilling, rewarding lifestyle within this career where they don't have to worry about like backstabbing or um, trying to poach people's clients and stuff like that. Like, just quickly, I'll, I'll say like, there have been some trainers that have reached out to some of my clients to try and poach them when they see the client in my Instagram story. And it doesn't really work out for them because I pride myself in building very strong connections with my clients and I don't lock them into long-term contracts. And so in most cases, the client just brings it up to me and I kind of look at that person differently. Um, but it's just like, there, no matter what industry we're in, there is just so much opportunity to be successful. And the only path to actually get there is an abundance mindset. And to add context or like some story to this, uh, in my spare time, I actually have, I go to different meetings with different business owners outside of the fitness industry. Many of them have, like there's some that are retired in their mid thirties. And the reason that I do this stuff is I like to learn. I like to learn other people's stories. I like to learn other people's life lessons. I like to figure out what I don't know because you don't know what you don't know. And I know. Does it benefit it, you? It benefits me. Do you feel like this yeah, benefits like you? For me, benefits me. Um, Keep it absolutely. going. Absolutely. Like it's just there <laughs> as far as development, personal development, professional development, there's so much opportunity beyond the fitness industry that we're just kind of leaving on the table. Like we could probably, we could go to a painter's convention and learn all about how to set a good first impression, how to market, how to price, how to scale, all this stuff. Uh, We could go to a baking convention where they're baking like uh, bread and stuff and they're learning all that stuff. And we could learn about how to have attention to detail and how like little things matter in our, like how we're programming for a client or rest periods or the volume of work that we put into a day. Like 
we can recontext a lot of other things. And it's because of a person's ego and competitive nature that they hold themselves back. And so in my own personal journey, I'm at a point where I'm like, okay, well, I have a pretty strong sense of confidence that I'm not wrong about this. But then when I see that other people are like concerned about competition and they're concerned about trying to take out somebody else, then I start to worry if maybe I should start to share that message and be like, hey, we can all be successful all together. And we can have a, a potluck and a barbecue and a good time, play some Frisbee and we'll all be okay. But only if we are all on board with this whole like enough room for everybody to succeed. And if somebody needs help, help them. Um, if somebody needs guidance, give them some guidance. If somebody messes up, take it easy, give them some feedback maybe, but you don't need to like completely slander them <laughs> across all the internet. Like, uh, there, there's just so much that people can experience in this industry. That's almost uncharted territory. And that's the longest rant I've ever gone on. So it's, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Uh... I think the, the the thing you mentioned there about an abundance mindset is is really key. It's something we talk to to clients about as well. To trainers, I think maybe one of the things that often holds trainers back, and I know I've been corporate of this in the past, is being overly concerned with competitors because you maybe have these moments of this is who I am, this is how I speak, this is the message that I give, and then we see other people doing stuff and we think oh shit, well, if that's how they're doing it, I should do like a version of that. And then what we do is just water down our message. We can be authentic and we can work with the people that we want to work with and serve the people that we feel like we can serve best by speaking directly to them. We can still respect what other people do. We can still learn from what other people do, but we don't have to do exactly what they do. And I I have, again, fallen culprit to that countless times. And I think there's there's probably a point on the Dunning Kruger graph there that 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 sits where oh shit I don't know anything and so I'm going to try and learn from everybody all the time and I'm going to try and take everybody's message and put it together as my own and then you get a little bit farther and you're like oh well I know I don't know anything but I know enough and now I can speak specifically to those people and I think personally that's that's actually where I'm at I'm at that point now where I know I could work with a lot of different people but there's a type of person that I like to work with the most I have good success with I have good experience with they kind of working with them invigorates me it's fulfilling work and I know that I typically work really well with men in between the ages of 30 and 60 who fall right into the category of CEOs executive industry pros who went from being pretty athletic and being quite good at everything from a physical standpoint to starting the career ladder and getting the shit kicked out of them and, and now they have no idea what's going on that 10 years down the line and they've either got kids or a partner or a job that pulls them in all these different directions and very similar to us in the pandemic we just don't know how we got from point a to point b when they're just there and so i know that that's the person that i typically work with really well now i still work with other people in different facets but i know that i can serve that cohort really well so why not create a product and a service that that matches all those needs together. And that ideally is what I'm going to try and do with the transformation program that I'm putting together, which is called Built by You. And the reason it's called Built by You is because I can tell people what to do and I can give them the methods, but having them understand how it fits into their preferences, their lifestyle, their experiences, that's going to be between the two of us. And then they get to choose. I'm going to say, these are, these are some options that sound like they would fit pretty well within the A, B, and C lifestyle that you've just set up for me, that you just told me about. Which one sounds like it works best? Why don't we try this out? Why don't we try this out? And then because most 30 to 60-year-old men who are quite type A and fall into that category, I know that I can start narrowing down those goals anyway. I can start saying, hey, this is what I've done with the last 15 fellas who have fallen into this category. This is what's worked well for them. This is pretty tried, pretty tested. This, the vast majority of what we're going to do can very easily look like this because you know you remind me of a person who I worked with in the past and, and it, it, it can look very similar to that. And then we can tweak little bits, but it is the idea of it being built by that person to fit what we know works from a methodological standpoint. Methodological, that's a word. 
actually have them choose and fit it into their lifestyle. This is another point on the Dunning-Kruger is that people have these biases of like, this is, this is the only way to do this thing. Kettlebells are the answer. You shouldn't flex your spine. You, you should, you shouldn't back squat. You should only do unilateral lower body work. Uh, okay, great. I, I'm not sure that that's going to work for everybody. So I'm going to take what we know works about health and fitness. And I'm going to think beyond the initial biases. And I'm going to say, these are some options. And based off what you're telling me, these are some of the best options. These are kind of the top two or three. Let's pick one of these. Let's go for it. Let's make it, let's see how it works. And then adjust rather than trying to cram what my bias is down somebody's throat. I know enough and I know what works really well because experience tells me that. And then I'm going to give people an opportunity to build it in for themselves. So that's predominantly where I'm going to go with that transformation program, which I'm very excited about. I'm going to launch that in January. Right now, it's just giving people more information on a weekly basis about what it's about, how it works, who it's for, what's going to be included, all that kind of fun stuff, and then actually getting people into it. And I think that's maybe where a lot of the work is going to be. People are going to say, am I the right fit for this? And I'm probably going to have to say no to some people, I would have thought. Because what I don't want to do is take 50 people's money and it be shit for 25 of them and it be okay for 10 of them and it be really good for the mm. rest of them. I'd much rather take five people's money and be like, this is the thing. This is the thing that's going to like blow you away and it blow them away. And then maybe there's that. that's the abundance mindset from an individual standpoint is if I can do a really good job with these five, next time I run this program, maybe I'll offer 10. And those five that were in it are going to, love it they're gonna have great reviews to write about it they're gonna stick around afterwards in the legacy component of it they're gonna be the cheerleaders for the people in the new cohort it's not right for everybody but the people that it is right for holy shit it's gonna be right for them and i think that kind of ties nicely into what you were saying before which is there is room for everybody we're all going to have our different versions and our different skill sets and i know that i'm not right for everybody but the people that i am right for they're going to have a great yeah. time. It's going to be brilliant. They're going to get great results. It's going to be fun. Well, I mean, you brought up a lot of good points, and there's one analogy that I wanted to use, and then just one uh, one sort of point that kind of adds on. So what I've experienced, because I just, I'm just i notorious for doing too long, didn't read posts on Instagram. I'll like talk all kinds of things about my thoughts and my experiences and my feelings and all kinds of stuff. So people know me pretty well. And so if they're sick of me, they've unfollowed or they muted. But if they gravitate towards the stuff that I put out, they have a really strong understanding mm -hmm. um, that we are aligned with values and just like what our idea of like why we're using fitness is. Like one of my most recent online clients came to me because of a post that I said where it was like, I just want you to live longer and make you harder to kill. And it's because I didn't so much talk about how my aim was to make them lose weight. It was more so just like mm -hmm. at whatever it takes to make you live longer and be genuinely happy. That's what we do when we work together. And they liked that idea. Mm -hmm. So where I would be reluctant, I would, I would feel almost self-conscious about putting myself out there in such a way that wasn't always popular or didn't like gain notoriety or wasn't the most shareable. It's had the best outcome mm -hmm. for client acquisition because like everybody that reaches out to me is like pretty well suited for the service that I offer. Now the analogy before yeah. I forget, I had a thought. So this thought is going to involve some participation on your end. Um, what, is the, what is the heaviest lift out of all the lifts in the gym that you do that you're most competent in? Uh, probably leg press. Sweet. So what does that look like for you? What's like the sets and reps and the weight? Uh, the last time I took the leg press, as far as I could take it, I think it was in around the 600s for four sets of in between 10 and 15 if I was using reps and reserve. Sweet, sweet. So, so enough to make me feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have people think about this for a second because then I'm going to share with you my example of the – the lift that I like the most and the most competent in that I can lift the most in. So it would be the trap bar deadlift. It's my favorite lift. And if I really apply myself, I can get uh, 
probably three sets of 10 at 500 pounds. Um, and I love it. It makes Gross. me feel awesome. It makes me feel like a beast. So the thing that I'm going to put to the audience, to you, to me, is that uh, if I go to the gym, my gym in Edmonton, and I do maybe like three sets of 11, is that going to hold you back from getting your numbers on the leg press? Is that, are you asking for yeah. a response? <laughs> I've never, I never thought about anybody else in the gym for longer than a split second. I just don't give a shit. I'm mm. there for me. So no. So if, if we take <laughs> the same approach to our goals within just our life, and this could be like who wants to get the most dogs. This can be who wants to get like the house with the pool, or it can be who wants to be the most self-sufficient in their training career where they're able to travel, um, send flowers to Matt Ferrara and uh pet dogs yep. like it can be the most wholesome goal but the thing that i just wanted to remind people in case they didn't quite get it before is that like you can crush the goals that you love do the lifts that you love and just absolutely dominate and then i can do it too and it can be two different things and you can be successful and i can be successful and we won't have a negative impact on each other if nothing else we might actually encourage one another to keep going subliminally because when i see some like when mm -hmm. my, my friends a lot of them do bjj like brazilian jiu-jitsu and i don't do brazilian jiu-jitsu but when i watch them get a new belt or compete or go and travel somewhere for a competition i'm like checking the website i'm seeing how they're doing i'm watching their posts i'm clicking like sometimes i toss some hearts in there like i'm all over that shit because if they crush it I'm going to crush it, but my category is going to be mm -hmm. something else, but I don't care. And so that, that has been like rocket fuel for me. Um, and it's just, sometimes we just need that reminder that like, if we had a bad month and we were at 50% of our projected, what we thought we were going to make, and then somebody else just gets 200%. It's not bad. It's almost like a crystal ball telling to us that if we stay the course, mm -hmm. we're going to have a good time. Um, I've got a colleague that absolutely lit it up in 2020. It was one of the best years of his career. And he's got like six years on me experience wise. And so I was like, okay, so six years from now, I can kind of anticipate how I might catch a break in my career. And like right now it's two years from there and I feel like I'm catching a break. And so A, we can't compare ourselves to others, but B, when we see someone else, get the rewards of their consistency if we continue to be consistent ourselves stay the course put in the reps keep putting in effort consistent effort we can only go up we can't go down like sure life sucks and it tests you sometimes um but we're destined for greatness if we just don't quit yep the progress comes from consistent effort over time absolutely and so if you can say to yourself that you're applying consistent effort over time then great you're probably going to make progress there's also times when you potentially could pull the plug and say i've done enough now and this actually isn't for me and that rather than having that attach yourself to a sunken cost theory there's maybe a crescendo moment where you have to have a tough conversation great that's fine as well that the oh, i've started saying this quite a lot and i would imagine it gets frustrating especially to my wife is that it just doesn't matter it just doesn't matter that thing just doesn't matter that i can't control shit about what that person thinks or what that person does the person that was doing shadow boxing in the squat rack the other day when i was needed to use the squat rack like i can't do anything about it like what's the point i can't get pissed off with them i can ask them hey you're almost done but like being really fucked off about them shadow box like what like, what yeah. can i do it's just a waste of my time and energy i may as well just put my time and energy into finding something else to do that's going to contribute to me if however being really pissed off at them gives me life great go for it i'll put money on the fact that nobody when they really look themselves in the eye actually getting pissed off at people gives them life because it fucking doesn't again i'll give it i'm happy to be proven wrong but i'm gonna go put, put myself out there and suggest that it probably doesn't and that that would be a hard point to I disprove mean, there's been a ton of just ton of matter. scenarios where i've been in that situation where i'm like looking over at a part of the gym and somebody's doing something interesting that i've never seen before and 
knee jerk reaction is often like, that's different than what I do. I want that to be more like what I do. And then what I've learned is that uh, I'll just take it, take it in stride. Like tons of times when like maybe the trap bar wasn't available or the squat rack or whatever, there's actually like 40 squat racks at my gym. So that doesn't have to often happen. But in any case, yeah. I'll often be like, okay, I'll work on my grip strength, do some farmer carries for like the next 15 minutes. And then the 15 minutes pass and then they're good to go. And then I'm good to go. Can always just yeah. wait. Yeah, you can always just wait. And if you are looking to, it, this comes back to the age old thought of, you know, you can get ahead by working really hard or you can you can try and get ahead by keeping other people down. Those people don't, that, like that's not going to last for very long. And that's probably a miserable existence. And if it's not a miserable existence for that person, it sounds miserable to me. So one of the best ways that you can just keep making progress is to keep doing your shit. And I'll say that from a side, from a, almost tangentially, by not getting pissed off about that person shadow boxing in the squat rack, I went somewhere else and I did that thing. And then a kid in the gym said to me, "How do I do X? Can I ask you for some advice?" Can I? And like that, I live mm. for that shit. It's great. And now he follows me on Instagram. And then he sent me a message the other day saying, "Like, oh, I saw this thing. I saw you doing it in the gym earlier on. Like, a little bit weird at first, but now it's fine." Uh, you know, can I ask you this question? I, if I'd have been downstairs getting really pissed off about that guy shadow boxing in the squat rack, uh, nothing, nothing good could have happened outside of me thinking that I was superior to that person because I wouldn't shadow box in the squat rack. That just doesn't fucking matter. Just doesn't matter. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> that's it. You're like, decide whether that thing matters, and if you can even have a modicum of belief that it doesn't matter, it probably doesn't matter. Get the on other it. interesting component is oftentimes life experience has taught me that when I'm noticing something that's unusual and it's kind of like set me off, chances are that individual weird as they may seem on that first impression is going to be a full circle moment later on where something in their skill set or personality or just their character, if I don't burn that bridge is going to pay off. Like there's lots of instances, like let's say you're, you're in a blizzard and you need somebody to give you a boost. Chances are person doing the shadow boxing and the squat rack is the one with the cables to give you a boost. So it's like, you can't and, forget that stuff. And even if it's mm -hmm. not, even if it's not, even if you never see that person ever again, then by burning that bridge, you close the door to being able to do it. But even if you never see them again, you still have a chance. You still have a chance that if you, don't judge that person if you don't get really pissed off by him, if you don't waste your time getting annoyed by him, even if it's this person is hateful, then you can just move on. You can just go move on. That's and again, some people find it really cathartic to be really pissed off. And there's probably a, a level of processing to being pissed off in, in really difficult situations. Like me, you, everybody else, we all have reasons to be pissed off sometimes. So go through that processing, but at some point there will be enough is enough and you just gotta keep going. Because being pissed off at somebody all the time is not a play. Not it's not a way I, I necessarily want to be doing my thing, and, and I can't see it being particularly good for <laughs> for <Yeah>. business <laughs> all the time. Yeah, if you're the person, if you're the trainer that's constantly shitting on other trainers, you your clients are. are they're not your clients are not the people I want to work with if they're okay with like being in the gym with somebody who's constantly shitting on somebody else. That's not for me. That's not for me. But it might be for somebody else. And if that's your shtick, then great, you're gonna attract those people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like at the end of the day, with what we've talked about with like just like being surrounded by different people and just their mentality and how that can impact you, I often uh talk about like the the crab bucket mentality. So you're at this bucket and it's filled with crabs and there's no way you're ever getting it out because the crabs are always going to pull you down. So you don't want to be stuck in that zone. And so more and more as we ascend through the years and get older and stuff, like who we surround ourselves with matters. And sometimes it's not like a physical <laughs> proximity thing. Sometimes it's just like a time, like sharing time. So you and I on the show, we're sharing time and we're going to benefit from each other's presence um, that's where people start setting boundaries or setting like price tags on their time because it's going to move them further away from their goals in the long term. So hopefully people got lots mm -hmm. of takeaways from this, but generally speaking, I kind of want to make sure people know how to find you. Like what are your resources that you would direct people to if they're trying to track you down? 
two things. I do most of my stuff on Instagram, and that's just kind of general daily musings. There's lots of pictures of my dog on there uh, and travels. I do a lot of traveling as well. Uh, and that's just at Coach JW. That's J A Y W. And then my website is where I write most of my long form stuff and where people can find the the services that I offer, which is just coachjw.com. C O A C H J A Y W. I don't like my full name in my web address because I don't know, it just seems like a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's Coach JW. That welcome. works. That's awesome. Well, with that being said, I'd like to thank you so much for making your first appearance on the Lifestyle Chase. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me, Chris. Appreciate it. Mate.